welcome to the Legislative Report. I'm State Representative Rosemary Brown. I'm joined today with Dr. Jeffrey Jerry from St. Luke's. He is an infectious disease specialist, among many other titles I know that you do as well for the healthcare network. So, um, Doctor, thank you so much for being with us today. We are going to have a detailed conversation um, specifically about your position in infectious disease, uh, St. Luke's, the network, and then also a little bit about one of our, my priorities too, as well as the state with Lyme disease and tick-borne illness, which we seem to rank extremely high in, unfortunately. So thank you for being here. So thank brag you, about Mary. yourself. It's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, brag about yourself for a little bit. Tell us about your background and, and um, how you come to the, the network. My, my background uh, is I was trained as an internist with a subspecialty in infectious diseases. Uh, I received my, my subspecialty training at Columbia University. And then uh, we moved out to the Lehigh Valley, and I've been here for 40 years. And I also have an administrative job. I'm the senior vice president for medical and academic affairs. Uh, so that amounts to being the chief medical officer of our network, which now has a, soon to be 11 hospitals in two states, including St. Luke's in Monroe County. Which is amazing, and we're very happy to have St. Luke's here. It's been a wonderful addition to the community. We're very uh, pleased to be here. Yes, it's doing great work on the healthcare end and also jobs, so we're very happy. And uh, that's amazing. So you have a lot of responsibility within the medical uh, physicians within St. Luke's, so you see a lot of the needs and um, maybe the shortages to of physicians and, and the struggles among healthcare providers and the patients. And that's one thing that really I wanted to talk to you about. As, as a legislator, there's only so much, I think as a legislator, you can really do um, by creating a law or, or changing a, you know, a law, fixing a law. But we try to create an environment that helps any situation, whatever it may be. And my background in the pharmaceutical world years back um, has me a little more comfortable with your position and understanding on what you do. But I think a lot of the viewers, to really understand what an infectious disease doctor does in that specialty of your work, uh, can you give a little more background about sure. that? I mean, everybody knows what the word infectious, but, but there's a lot more to it. Yes, th there are. And when we speak about infectious diseases, we're talking about diseases that can be caused by bacteria, viruses, fungus or fungi, as well as things like parasites. So there's a pretty large gamut of diseases that that entails. And most of us work both in a hospital setting as well as outpatient. And I think uh, most people realize that infections can be part of any major illness. They can be certainly the thing that brings you into a hospital. For instance, if you have pneumonia uh, and if you have surgery, you can develop a wound infection as an example and that uh, infections are also frequently a part of cancer therapy as well. So uh, we see a wide range of patients, and it ranges really from uh, neonates to uh, the elderly. Yeah, it's, it's a very, like you said, broad and interesting arena, and, and some things that maybe doctors don't, don't always deal with or don't see enough of that ends up coming down your way. Yes. Uh, as you know, that uh, we not only deal with diseases that are in our own community, but many of our uh, community members travel. And uh, these days, you can be virtually any place in the world within 24 hours. So it's quite possible that someone can pick up something on a travels, whether it's in Asia or Africa, and bring it back. And we obviously have to be acquainted with that as well. Right. And prevention is a big part of our role, too. Right. That it's one thing to treat, but prevention is always better. Right. Well, it could cause you a little anxiety if you start thinking about how fast people can travel around the world and how right. fast something can be transmitted and moved and shared. And right. Um, but but one of the the big topics that we've been talking about is how Pennsylvania, with Lyme disease, is the number one in reported cases. It is. And uh, we're blessed to have such a beautiful area, especially in the Poconos, lush. Uh, the nature. We, we really love the outdoors and hiking and biking and everything that we do, but we have a very high risk here. And um, as an infectious disease doctor, I wanted you to see if you could acquaint people a little bit more with Lyme disease and what we do know and what we don't know. And I think that that's, to me, 
there's a lot of unknowns still, there, if I'm not. There certainly are, Rosemary. Yeah. And, I, and you hit it on the head when you said that Pennsylvania is number one, and by the way, New Jersey is number two. We have over 11,000 cases that are reported in this state every year, and we know that many, many cases go unreported. Uh, so uh, both locally and as well as nationally, Lyme disease stands out. It is the number one reported vector-borne disease, in other words, the disease that's transferred by, in this situation, a tick. Mm -hmm. uh, so in, in other countries, it may be a mosquito that transfers malaria, but in our country, the big vector-borne disease is Lyme disease, and we certainly have it. So the big challenges are, first of all, to make the correct diagnosis, and early diagnosis always leads to early treatment and to much better results. Uh, we do know that there is testing uh, that has been available, but the testing is very imperfect. Right. So there's a lot of development that's going on. Uh, luckily so far, many of the standard drugs that are used to treat Lyme disease are effective. So as you, as you certainly know with many other diseases, resistance is a huge issue. Resistance for Lyme disease hasn't been that much of an issue. Uh, sometimes having a, the availability of drugs at a fair price is, because prices can range for a standard drug like doxycycline. Because of shortages, I've seen it go up 1,500% wow. almost overnight. So these are the, some of the challenges are to make sure that people get acquainted with the disease, that they get treated adequately, and that they are aware of what they can do for prevention. And there's quite a bit that people can do for prevention. Right, and uh, it is. It's an all-encompassing factor because you don't want to have be frozen and not go out and enjoy life and enjoy being out and Absolutely. about in the woods. Right. But um, you touched on the testing piece, and that's yes. always been my kind of confusion of why haven't we really established, do you think, in your opinion, a, a test that seems to be fairly accurate? Is it because there's so many pathogens, um, or is it Lyme? Like, why do you think there might be so many false negatives or positives. There are false positives yeah. as well, because there's, uh, in the kinds of methodology that we use, there's what's called cross-reactivity with other diseases. And so that does create a problem. I will say that the Center of Disease Control is well aware of this, as is the National Institute of Health, and there are a lot of efforts right now being looked at in terms of developing a much more accurate yeah. test and a test that would be accurate early on because in the very earliest stages of right. Lyme disease, the test is oftentimes negative. And then if you went around and tested a population of people who have no symptoms at all, in a random fashion, you would find that a number of those people would have positives. And the question is, what does that mean? It oftentimes doesn't mean very much. Right. Yes. Yeah, so that's confusing. So for viewers watching, you hate to scare people. It's not right. meant to scare. It's more to make aware and educated. But you would say, or be able to say that if you've gotten a Lyme test done and it's negative, um, I think one of the things I like to always talk about is let's hope that test is right. Correct. But again, it's a guide. And, do, and because of the inaccuracy of that test, people have to take that with um, caution. Yes. And uh, again, you're, you're quite correct. It's often been said that Lyme disease is a clinical diagnosis that's supported by a laboratory right. test. Right, and it's true. And yes. I, it's hard to be a physician with this, ki this type of disease state when you're kind of going on symptoms that you might have and I might have that might be very varied, right? That's Depending. correct. So, so one Lyme disease patient and another Lyme disease patient could present very differently. Yeah, there are multiple presentations, and that's one of the things that uh, you begin to appreciate if you've been seeing this over a number of years, that not everybody is a textbook, and even the standard rash can vary in its uh, right. expression. But nonetheless, having said that, there is a certain baseline that you can refer to, and if you do see that classical rash, uh, you can be pretty certain that that's the, that's the diagnosis. That's the and uh, So there are things that you can kind of lean on. Right, right. Yeah, it's very difficult. And, and like you said, if, if you have had a tick on you and um, you test too soon, 
it would come negative. Or, yeah. But later on, it may come up in a test, so it has to be very careful. It, it does, and then testing later on in the disease tends to be more accurate. Right. So I think we right. can we can look at it that way. I don't want people to disregard the test. Right. So it does require both your your clinical acumen as well as a laboratory test. Right. So would you say it's fair? And I hate to put words in your mouth. You know, I I kind of feel this way, but it's almost like you have to be your best advocate with this type of uh, disease state if you feel something is not quite right, not going away, yes. or if it's you know, been tested for a lot of other things, but it just keeps coming back, whatever the symptom may be, you know, being that we're, we're pretty high on, on the scale for this, because some of these ticks are so tiny that you would never find the tick, right? Yeah, it could fall uh, and, off. and uh, again, I think that's a very important point that only about up to two thirds of people can really give you a history of knowing that they've been bit by a tick, because oftentimes right. the tick uh, is so small that uh, you don't even notice it. Uh, it's been described when it's engorged that it's the size of a poppy seed, and we know mm -hmm. how small that is. And that's and engorged, right? That that's is after engorged. being on you, right? And, and, you know, when people think about ticks, they often think about the kind of tick that is oftentimes seen on, on their dog, as an example, a brown dog tick. That is not the tick right. that uh, gives you Lyme disease right. and not the same form. Right. So um, our time goes so fast on, on these shows, sure. and being an infectious disease doctor, you know, the use of antibiotics is something that we're very blessed to have. So we have to be careful how we use them. Yes. And um, give us a little feedback on that and why it's so important uh, with resistance in, in sort of layman's terms of why you don't want to develop resistance with drugs and overuse or inaccurate use. And then why this becomes a struggle with the Lyme disease treatment. Okay, well in general, uh, antibiotics, as with almost any medication, uh, there's always potential side effects. So at the very least, you wanna use the right drug for the right bug and at the right time. And that applies across the spectrum. Uh, for Lyme disease, certainly that is true as well. Uh, it isn't the only tick-borne disease, and we also know that uh, oftentimes it, uh, it can coexist with other tick-borne mm -hmm. diseases such as ehrlichiosis or anaplasmosis, babesia, which we, by the way, our group right. was the first group to, to report its presence in Pennsylvania, and now it is certainly well entrenched. So anywhere between 5 and 25 percent of people who have Lyme disease will have a coexisting infection, and you have to make sure that you're using the right drug that might be appropriate for, for those things as well. Right. Yeah, it's, it's pretty tricky, and um, I thank you so much for being here. I know St. Luke's does a great job, uh, but I thought it was important just to get a little feel from you on the disease state and um, your thoughts on, on what we're dealing with as an infectious disease doctor. And I do want to close out with my last statement is that if you treat early, the results in Lyme disease are excellent. And so a lot of the things that people are very afraid about and that they've heard, it really won't occur if you can get good early treatment. The results are truly very, very favorable. Right. Well, thank you so much, doctor. And I think that that's a great break to take because if you're aware and you're paying attention and you're educated on um, risk factors and how to prevent and if you do not feel well to get treated as soon as and possible. And I noticed that you have a lot of educational yeah. materials in your office we that do. are available. <laughs> we so. do. But thank you very much. It's my pleasure. Thank you. We're going to take a quick break and we'll be right back with the legislative report. Did you know that there are six ornate bronze chandeliers hanging in the house chamber? The four large chandeliers are estimated to weigh three tons each, yet these iron and brass fixtures painted in 18 karat gold manage to dangle effortlessly. It takes 168 light bulbs to light the large chandeliers and 84 light bulbs on each of the smaller chandeliers. As you can imagine, changing the light bulbs when they burn out is far from easy. Workers must build scaffolding in order to reach their 1,450 light bulbs. Today, special, long life, low wattage energy saving bulbs are used to lessen the amount of times that the light bulbs will need to be replaced. Now you know. 
Welcome back to the Legislative Report. I'm State Representative Rosemary Brown. We're continuing our conversation on Lyme disease and tick-borne illness in Pennsylvania. And I'm joined by Harriet Loazu, right? I said it correctly. Loazo, yes. Loazo, <laughs> Loazo. See, I knew I was going to do that That's to you. That's okay. Um, nurse practitioner provider with uh, Wayne Memorial um, Community Health Center and part of the tick Born Wellness Center that we have in Pike County now established, which is tremendous. So very excited to have you here. I think I'll be learning through you even more so as we, we do our conversation today and hoping to provide that to the people who are watching that they may have a resource out there as we are concerned with our um, number one status of reported cases of Lyme disease in Pennsylvania. So um, before we start, I, I did want to point out to the viewers that um, we have worked very hard. I've established a grant program with East Strasburg University that if you are lucky enough to find a tick on you or on one of your family members, that you can remove the tick and have it tested for free. Uh, they will test for Lyme disease and three or four other pathogens at East Stroudsburg University. So that is through a grant from the state. Um, that gives us a chance to understand what's inside these ticks, and it also helps you as uh, a resident of Pennsylvania to have a tool to work with your physician. Again, it's a tool to see how long the tick has been on and engorged, and if the tick does present with any sort of pathogens in it that you may have a concern with your physician. So um, good to know, ticklab.org, if uh, anyone is interested. So on that note, um, unfortunately, if someone is concerned or believes that they have uh, Lyme disease or tick-borne illness, this is where you come in as uh, really a, a specialty for something that has never been developed before um, in our area or region or even across the state as much as I've heard. So tell us a little bit about yourself first of all. Let's let you brag a little bit. Oh, not, not a lot of bragging. Um, I'm a family nurse practitioner, um, educated and certified, board certified by the American National uh, Nurses Certification. Um, I had worked for New York State Department of Health, communicable disease supervisor, um, and we were seeing Lyme disease as early as the 80s, um, shortly after Lyme, Connecticut right. had, had been identified. Um, I think what's exciting about what's happening in Pike County now is that through the Pike County Tick-Borne Disease Task Force, the Wayne County Lyme Disease Task Force, um, and the collaboration with Wayne Memorial Hospital Community Health Centers um, and Executive Director uh, Frederick Jackson, that we've been able to open a tick-borne disease wellness center. Um, we're located at 750 on Route 739 in Lords Valley, Pike County, Pennsylvania. Which is great, which is absolutely wonderful because you're not having people have to drive hours and hours to go to someone that may have a little bit more focus on this type of disease state. Correct. So as we look at the Wellness Center, and, and we're grateful that this is established here. Would I, as a patient, need to be tested positive before I could go to the center, or would I get tested there? How would that work? Um, how it works at our Wellness Center is basically anyone can come in as a new patient um, if they've never been tested if they suspect they might have Lyme disease. Uh, some people cannot remember a tick on them, but they, you know, you, you can pull up information online and it seems as though they might have Lyme disease. Um, you do not need a referral from a primary care physician or a specialist. Right, because that's specialist. always a concern for people. Yes. Right, do I have to go through several channels before I get there to that? That no, you, you do not have to. Some people are, but that is not a requirement right. to be seen at the wellness center. What we tried to do is set it up so there is access to care for everyone. Um, so if you've had a tick on you, we appreciate if you bring the tick in. Uh, if you're removing a tick, whether it's embedded or not, 
it's a good thing to know, A, has it been embedded? B, how long has it been on you, even if it's not embedded? All these little clues help us right. to care for you, diagnose you, and then come up with a plan. Right. The risk factors with everything. Correct. Okay. Um, I would say in terms of accessibility, it's geographically accessible to Wayne, Pike, and Northern Jersey counties. Um, it's also because we take most major, major insurances, even from New Jersey, even if you're out of network, there is a portion that will be covered. And uh, Wayne Memorial Community Health Centers also have a sliding fee schedule. So if you don't have insurance or you're underinsured, you fill out the paperwork, and then you're given the financial assistance that you need. That's nice because I think that's always the concern too is, okay, great, so I can get in there, I can do this, but will they have to pay out of pocket? Will I have to pay insurance? What is that? So you can sort of find that out just like any other physician's specialty care um, when they're there to kind of talk Correct. about the cost of treatment and things Correct. like that. But it's nice to hear that there's a vast amount of insurances that are accepted because that helps, again, like you said, with access of care. So from your end, with the, it seems like a wonderful center as far as don't be afraid to call us, don't be afraid to come in if you suspect or if you're already tested for positive for a Lyme disease or tick-borne illness. Um, and then the payment structure and some of the reasonable factors that go along with it. What's your feeling on the testing measures, on the accuracy for patients? You know, I had um, one of the infectious disease doctors we spoke to earlier in the program that unfortunately we still have some strong concerns with the accuracy of testing. And what I'm really trying to communicate, one piece of this is to use that again as a tool, as well as if you're able to find the tick. These are tools to help you. But can you give from your perspective of your specialty treatment on the testing and, and what patients should expect or what they should be asking for or looking for in the testing measures? Well, what we do at the Wellness Center is if they're new to us, I try to get an ELISA, a Western blot, and a molecular PCR on each patient. Why? Because there are a lot of false negatives as well as false positive, more false negatives. So with testing with a three-tier system, you have a better chance at catching a positive right. Then somebody saying just negative, just negative, just negative. Right, right. So you're sort of covering a roundabout basis. Yes, we, we try to cover it as much as we can. Do you do most physicians when a patient goes in and maybe they're experiencing symptoms, whatever they may be, because they could be varied. Um, maybe we'll ask you that too, as far as what are the most common symptoms. But do most patient, most physicians test all three levels like that, or is it usually one or the other? It's it's usually one or the other. Um, what I'm seeing patients who are bringing their records in is ELISA and Western blot. They're pretty much tied together with with most labs, right. um, you know, lab services, um, or some of them are doing the PCR testing. Without the other two. Correct. Right. So I, it, it's very unusual to see the combination. Yeah. Do you believe that there's still so much to be learned about this disease states? I mean, from Lyme oh, to the abs other? Absolutely. Absolutely. Because most of the ticks are co-infected. Right. So we have multiple diseases. Um, I'm still adding in extra tests for some patients. Uh, Bartonella is out there. We've been treating that. Um, you know, Rocky Mounted Spotted Fever, you have to check for that. Uh, you know, the, the days of what we used to believe in epidemiology, what we always learned was, you know, there's geographic boundaries to certain diseases, but now we're a global society, so that doesn't exist anymore. Right. And people will take poofy on a plane anywhere. And what, what is on that, there could be a tick, there could be a flea. Right, and then it just and travels and it, it goes and it, that's it. It, 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 gets, it gets spread. People 
are much more mobile than they ever used to be, especially in America. So you're going to visit your grandchildren, you're going here, you're going, and things get transmitted. So years ago, um, when I was stationed in the South, you know, there, there were particular diseases that were inherent to the South. Well, that doesn't exist anymore. Right. Right. So because everybody's uh, going up and uh, right. every, everybody's traveling all over, which is great for, for families, but yeah. diseases love it even more. Right. It, it, you know, I said to Dr. Uh, Jerry earlier, is it, it can cause you a little bit of anxiety when you start to think about how fast something can be spread and transmitted. Yes. A uh, very serious subject on that. But, um, you know, with, with Lyme disease and tick-borne illness, the diagnosis, not only from the lab test, which is still difficult, as you mentioned, so you try to do this three-tiered system, uh, presentation of symptoms. Mm -hmm. what, can you, what can you give some of the viewers about presentation of symptoms and maybe how I might present differently than you would present and, and what sometimes shows, I know the, uh, the bullseye rash was always something that was known to be attached to Lyme, but from what I've read in most of the research, it's really there only about 40% of the time. So anything that you can offer as far as symptomatic consistency or, or things that might alert people, maybe if they had never saw a tick on them. That, that, that is very true, and I'd say about 30% of the people coming in have said, I, I've never, I don't remember a tick on me. Um, but the symptomology is part of the diagnosis because that's done on the clinical side of the house. Right. That's not the, the, the tool testing side of the house. So you can have uh, several different types of rashes besides the bullseye that the CDC has now recognized and allows us to go ahead and treat based on those rashes. So with different presentations different of rashes. Different types of rashes. Different types of rashes. Okay. Um, the symptomology, um, there is um, Lyme cardiac arthritis, mm. there's Lyme neurological symptoms, right. there's Lyme arthritic symptoms. So we're, very we're very able to hone in on, on the, the patient's presentation, then I can channel my line of questioning. And, and try to categorize them. Not that they have to be categorized, but then you know a better idea what you're dealing to help them with the symptoms. Right. So we're not only treating the tick-borne diseases, part of our philosophy, why we opted to call it a wellness center is dealing with the fatigue syndrome, the pain, helping people navigate those waters as well as recovering from the acute process of the right. Lyme disease. Right. As we go through this as a state and a country, uh, this, this, these new disease states, uh, it's, it's wonderful to have such a great center right here in Pike County um, and very accessible. So the, the time on the show goes so very fast, Harriet, but I thank you very much for being here. Thank you and, for having um, us. You know, talking a little bit about more of this in detail and then also giving how people can can utilize the center so i'm going to let you throw out the phone number real quick if you know it do you know the phone number off the top of your head if not we'll put it up on the board but. okay 570-775-7100 good good sometimes i know it's, it's, you know you're so used to just going there and working <laughs> so um but but that's an if and this is great information for everyone so thank you again thank you for having thank me you. i appreciate it thank you for joining the legislative report i'm state representative rosemary brown if you have any questions regarding this show or any other state related matter please feel free to contact my office Thank you.